Well, for our final group session here, talking to some of the greatest showrunners working in television today, we've got Carrie Aaron, Damon Lindelof, Bruce Miller, Tanya Siracho, and Nichelle Tramble Spellman. Um, first question I wanted to ask is we're not going to talk about your shows specifically. Uh, we've already done that in the, in the individual segments. I'm a, just a huge television history nerd, so I would love to know from each of you a couple of shows as you were growing up or maybe in college or in your 20s that really impacted you. And we'll start with uh, Bruce. Hill Street Blues and My So-Called Life um, just, you know, taught me what taught me what television was and taught me how to write. And, and you know, those are the shows I owe a big debt to from growing the dramas where I really saw what it could do. Michelle, what about you? You know, um, the show that I really loved and missed was Felicity, and then I loved Friday Night Lights. Those two shows, I just really loved them both. Um, Felicity was just a nice point of view from this young woman going off to college together, and Friday Night Lights, I think that I cried every episode of that show because <laughs> I loved it so much. I'd watch in tears all the time, and there wasn't anything sad happening. It was just so well done and so lovely and had such great characters. Still one of my all-time favorites. See, all four that have been named so far really played with the idea of story structure and, you know, things that maybe weren't even being done on television when they debuted. Carrie, what about you? I have a lot of sentimental favorites. I, I, I have to say the one show really to, to this day that just blew my brain open was Twin Peaks because I had just never seen anything like that on television um and i i was just mesmerized by it um and i still have such admiration for it when i was really young i made, met david lynch and he signed an autograph for me and in true david lynch style it's all in dots i don't know <laughs> even know how you do that um uh, you know in, a, in an autograph book but he did which makes total sense from him what about you tanya well i it's just it's it's about what moment they played in my life. I had just moved here um, and I, my English was terrible. So Saved by the Bell was helping me be American. <laughs> so I would watch it after school because I was getting made fun at, at school. So Saved by the Bell, at least for, for my mouth, was very important. And, um, and then uh, as a young adult, um, the L word, because I'd never seen us love like that, you know? And it, 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 so it was a, a, like a cultural moment, at least for my community in Chicago when we were sort of absorbing that. So like, um, it was like a permission, you know, that show. And Damon, what about you? Carrie took mine. Uh, Twin Peaks uh, <laughs> sort of changed everything for me. And uh, I would watch it with my dad and we'd record every episode on, on VHS and, um, and, and, and sort of try to determine who killed Laura Palmer. But I think the other show that, that sort of preceded that to some degree was Twilight Zone, which mm -hmm. I watched in syndication on, um, on, a, on a small black and white television uh, even though it was in black and white. And I just feel like there was something about those episodes in terms of my love of genre, but also weaving social commentary uh, into it. And just Rod Serling was like the coolest human being ever. <laughs> That's what I wanted to be when I grew up was, was Rod Serling. <laughs> Another question, and it, it may not even apply to all five of you, uh, um, but when I do interviews, uh, people ask me, you know, who are some of my favorites? And I always name off like the classic legendary kind of people, just because that's who I grew up watching, like a Bob Newhart or Alan Alda or Ed Asner, people like that that I've gotten to interview, uh, Carl Reiner. Um, is there ever been anybody that you got to hire on one of your shows that was um, a legend to you or somebody uh, for any of you that, 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 you were just so thrilled that you got to hire them onto your show. I was I was very excited uh, that we got to work with Marty Short. That was that was very very thrilling to me. That that day, yeah. He's one of the best ever. He's a, he's amazing, lovely too. That scene. Okay, everybody has a lot of heroes, but amazing. go ahead. Oh, it's just uh, that uh, in in Carrie's show. There's just a there's a scene where Steve Carell and Marty Short are talking for feels like 15 pages. <laughs> it's like ribbon. And it could have gone on for 35 more. I remember. Yeah. It was so, um, I, I I worked with um, Bob Newhart once. He was on ER. I was my first job in my first year, I think, and I didn't get anywhere near him. And I just watched him from afar. But that was that was amazing. And he was. 
just so hilarious. He just convinced everybody he was a doddering old man and he couldn't remember whether George Clooney was still on the show or anything. and it was total bullshit he just got everybody going when's George gonna come you know he had been gone for years it was brilliant I mean it was lovely I asked Peter Scolari once about working on Newhart and he said they had a new producing team every couple of years but Bob ran a tight ship I mean he he wanted things to start on time and end on time. And he wanted to be at dinner at eight o'clock, you know, on, on taping night. But that, it sounds like, uh, I love those kind of old, old school stories. All of you have been at award shows, won awards in several cases, been nominated. Uh, we'll start with um, Damon on this one. What does it mean not only for your career, but the show itself? What, what does it do for your show to the public and also within the industry? I, I think that, Obviously, given the moment that we're in now, there's a part, I, I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say that there's something sort of like yucky that feels about campaigning or, or talking about awards. But to your point, Chris, I do think that in, in many instances, there are some of the shows that were mentioned earlier, like a show like My So-Called Life, you know, which moves as a, into a Pantheon show, is, is championed by critics or, or maybe awards consideration or in sometimes a lack of awards consideration, being snubbed, you know, take a show like The Wire, um, which is widely acknowledged as the greatest show of all time um, and, and, and routinely snubbed by the Emmys. Friday Night Lights mentioned earlier, not until the, the very end was there any level of, of awards acknowledgement. And so this is an important conversation and having, it, it's basically been a decade since I've been nominated for an Emmy and you know, and and this maybe Watchmen will be, and maybe it won't be. But I will guarantee you that when I say it's an honor to be just to be nominated, I will mean it this time. <laughs> um, uh, it's not anything that I ever took for granted, but it's a very special thing when it happens because it's your peers. But you've won a boatload of Gold Derby awards. I think you won writing. I don't know, five or six years in a row, including both Lost and Leftovers? Which I think we can all agree are much more important and prestigious. Well, I'm going to tell you something. It's about 2,000 people voting. Anybody yeah. can vote. And but they're all TV, TV fanatics. Yeah, I mean, when deal. these people say you've got the best show or the best actor or the best writing, you know, I always tell them, you know, it's, it's a real compliment because these people watch everything. I agree completely and sincerely. Not to give us a plug. Um, what about somebody else on awards? And even like when the critics back your show, what does that do to help you on um, you know, getting, uh, getting the things you want for the show, getting the word out there about the show, more views coming in for the show? Uh, let's, let's go to Tanya. We would not have existed season two and season three if the critics had not like taking us, you know, amplified us because I, we didn't get the viewership. That's why I don't have a fourth season, you know? But I, I can honestly say that season two and season three happened because, you know, the 100% Rotten Tomatoes three seasons in a row, you know? They really, I, I, this is not blowing smoke. It's, it, it, it really kept us going. Um, so I, I'm, just, I, I'm just figuring out how this works, but this, it was, if we felt very seen, you know? Uh, by at least these individuals that like amplified us and so super grateful for, for that because they got us two seasons. And some of you have been doing this longer than others, but you've all been in the entertainment industry at some level or another where whether you were doing other things or plays or, or you know, the shows that you're doing now, some of you have been on movies. What do you know now that we, you wish the young version of you had known when you started? I think the thing I wish I had known is that no one knows anything. <laughs> Because I think I think I spent a lot of my youth thinking they did, and then figuring out that they actually didn't, and I just kind of could compress that time. Um, but I, it's just you know it's a, it's a we're creative. It's a creative world. There's always an X factor. It's like everybody's sort of you know weighing in on these things from different places. But at the end of the day, like you, if you're if it's your vision, you're the person who knows best how to move that forward doesn't mean that you're not collaborative or anything, but um, I, I, it just, I, <laughs> it just took me a while. I don't know. I, I started very young though. Um, so it took me a little while to realize that everyone's making it up. Michelle, what about you? 
You know, I think the thing that I'd wish I'd learned a little earlier was that the emphatic no is actually very freeing. You know, you mm. just, there's a, there's a tendency to want to please or to show that you could um, rise to the occasion and take on every single thing that's asked of you. And you actually have the freedom to do that when you say a no, no explanation, that's enough. And it's really hard as a woman, in my opinion, to not say no and then explain yourself. So just no and that's it is, it's, it, it, it's so freeing. You will love it. Everybody embrace it. <laughs> That sounds no. like something a parent knows after a few years. <laughs> yeah. I only have dogs, so I didn't oh, know. Okay. Yeah. They say no just because I said so. That's the yeah. only reason. <laughs> just like, no, that's it. <laughs> Tanya, what about you? The self-doubt is the, is the thing that I, I'm still trying to uh, get rid of. You know what I mean? And so um, I, I just wish I would have told myself a little earlier that it's okay to not know, like you're saying, Carrie. It's okay to not know. We'll figure it out. And that, that's the part that I'm like, don't be so freaking hard on yourself, you know? It's also like, it's normal. Like, who knows yeah. every beat of 10 hours of television <laughs> <laughs> when you start, you know? I, I, it's Or like what we should do when we were getting protested by the neighborhood. Okay, right. we all need to, we'll figure it out. Or yeah. um, the fires. We had to deal yeah. with the fires. So oh, let's call the insurance. Let's figure it out. You know, like, it's okay. It's it's also really fun once you take that pressure off of yourself because yes, then you're just problem solving. You know, it's fun at that point. Damon, how about you? I, I think it would be a version of stop talking so much. Um, <laughs> I, I, I really, I really felt like particularly it, my, my first time out that if there was silence in the room, I had to fill it. Um, and uh, that was my job. And more importantly, I had to, anytime anyone spoke, I, it had to flow through me. So I had to respond and, and do this. And I think much more interesting conversations develop between other writers, particularly in the writer's room or between um, uh, department heads at a production meeting or between actors on a set when you just let them talk to one another and, and keep your mouth shut. Um, and uh, I have found that the less I talk, the, the better the work is. So uh, I'm... I'm uh, mm -hmm. This this panel notwithstanding, it's a lesson that I've that I've learned over time. Bruce, we'll let you wrap up here for us. Tell us something you you know now that you didn't know when you started. First, I'd like to associate myself with the comments from Mr. Lindoff about not speaking too much. I think that um, uh, becoming a better listener was probably my biggest the the biggest thing that helped me become a good writer and a and a good uh, you know a better boss. Um, but, but I do think that one of the things I've learned, and I was just, I was thinking about this while everybody else was talking was, you know, um, I, I would say be very skeptical when people are assholes and say, this is the way things work. Because now I'm old enough, I've done this for a long time. I came out here a week after college. I mean, I've, this is the only fucking job I've ever had. Don't, when people do horrible things and then their excuses, this is just the way things work. And I'm here to tell you, it's not. Those people are jerks and they're operating jerky in this business and you don't have to operate that way and you don't have to accept them acting that way. Um, you know, people learn how to act in, in, in TV by watching television shows about executives, about watching, you know, where they think, oh, I'm tough, I do this. It's BS. The people, people are uh, cruel and petty and small and insecure and mean because they are small and petty and insecure and mean, not because that's the way the business has to go. So that would be the big lesson I think I've learned. And it really kind of came to bear this year where so many people said to me, hey, grow up, that's the way business works. And I'm like, you know, actually, I've been doing this a long time. I have a house. I, I bought a house with the money I made. I've been doing this a while. That's not the way it has to work. You're just a jerk. And so, sorry, that's the way it has to work for you, but I'm not going to do that. So. Um, that, you know, not to be strident, but that's kind of the biggest lesson I've learned lately is that everybody likes to excuse their bad behavior by saying everybody else does it. And it's just not true. Well, Michelle, Bruce, Damon, Carrie, uh, Tanya, thank you so much. You, the five of you have produced some of the greatest television that we've seen in the past 12 months. 
And that's why we wanted to uh, invite you today, not to help you campaign for Emmys, although that's nice, <laughs> but to put a spotlight on it. And if people haven't watched it yet, maybe they'll watch it now. So thank you all very much.